Once again, I thank you for stopping by to check out this episode of Vintage Audio Review. And in this episode, I'm going to talk about this Soundcraftsman RA7501 power amplifier. In 1981, this sold for $849, which adjusted for inflation in October 2023 would be about $2,900. It was the bottom of three lines of RA75XX power amplifiers. And while they were all rated at the same power levels, which would be 250 watts into 8 ohms, at not more than 0.02% THD from 20 hertz to 20 kilohertz, actually that's THD plus noise from 20 hertz to 20 kilohertz, and boasted a 375 watt per channel into 4 ohm capability, as well as a 750 watt into 8 ohms when operated as a mono amplifier. The amplifiers were differentiated by the kind of displays they had. The top of the line RA7503 featured an LED spectrum analyzer over here, as well as power meter LEDs going up the center. There was also an additional control for the sensitivity of the spectrum analyzer display. Now both the RA7502 and 7503 also had a very proportional LED for each channel that would glow green when the amplifier was operated in the very proportional mode, which means that the power supply normally operated at a lower voltage as it sensed a bigger output signal was coming in, it would adjust its voltage supplies to make them larger and hence the very proportional class H designation that they gave their power amplifiers at that time. And then those LEDs would glow green when they were operating at the higher power supply rails. Now the RA7502 did have power LEDs going up and down the center and this amplifier, the RA7501, does not have the very proportional uh, LEDs on each channel, but like all three, it does have clipping LEDs as well as a power protect LED. Now, all three have volume controls for each channel and they are detented, which is very nice. And overall, it's a professional style amplifier that also is suited for home use as long as you have a balanced to unbalanced input. In this case, you'll see around back there are phono plugs for the balanced inputs and you can use a quarter inch phono plug to a RCA unbalanced uh, a jack adapter, which is what I did to test these. So I'll zoom in on the front and then I'll show you some pictures of the back and then we'll pop the cover off and see what it looks like inside. And then we'll go over the data and I'll tell you what my listening experience is with the RA7501. Now I should point out that this is my own power amplifier that I recently replaced with a, another amplifier. And the main reason that I replaced it is I always wanted this other amplifier or that brand. And also, sometimes when I play my music real loud, this is typically hooked up to the uh, KEF 107 reference speakers or the Wilson Watt 3 Puppy 2 speakers. And when I'm particularly hooked up to the KEF 107s, the clipping light would come on when I play loud and I'm hoping that my new power amplifier or new used power amplifier, which will have its own review eventually, that those clipping lights will not come on because that amplifier is rated at 350 watts per channel and sometimes I get playing real loud. So anyway, um, the true clipping lights came on but when I listen sometimes, but it never really clipped to where you would hear the distortion. This amplifier I had seen on Craigslist for several months and it wasn't moving anywhere. So I called up the owner and asked if he might be able to take less money and he said that he would. So I told him that the stipulation was that I was going to come over there and measure it at his home. And if it looked good, then I would purchase it for him for that agreed upon price. So I brought my laptop and my Quant Asylum QA402 analyzer over and my dummy loads. And it was the evening and he had it out on his front porch with the front porch light on. And I started reaching around 200 watts per channel and his front porch light started dimming. 
And he said, well, I think that's probably good enough. He was a little concerned that <laughs> the porch lights were dimming as I was testing it. And the amplifier looked fine, and I ended up purchasing it, cleaning it up. I did a few uh, things to the mono bridge switch, which you'll see in the back. And other than that, it, it's been pretty much uh, untouched as far as replacing capacitors or anything like that, other than the regular cleaning of the front controls when I first got it. So that being said, we'll go into the uh, little tour of the front and then the back and data and, of course, my listening experience with this amplifier. I wanted to explain a little bit more about this mode selector jumper plug, this guy right here. Now, it should have a white line going across here, and if it's in mono, the white line would line up across here, and if it was in stereo, you would flip the plug, and then the white line would line up here. Now, this doesn't really help you much, so what I did is pull the jumper plug. It looks like this. Actually, I painted this white, but you can't really tell things very well. And you can see it, this jumper plug connects these two pins together or these two pins together. I decided I want something that was a little bit easier to use. I came up with this. I got some JB Weld and glued these little things. I have no idea what they were right now. And I glued them to the uh, end of the connector. And then I got some white paint and made a, a white uh, painted mark on it. It doesn't look very good, but it, it did work. So that I could plug this in and when I wanted to remove it, I could grip on these much easier than trying to stick something under here and try to pull it out. So that's kind of my solution to the jumper plug. Here is a more intimate view of the Soundcraftsman RA7501. And the first thing to note, it has two handles here, and they come in handy because this guy weighs 56 pounds. Since it does have rack mountable capability into 19 inch racks, those handles come in very handy. Starting over here on the left, we have our power button. When the power's on, we do get the red power on LED indicator. We also have a clipping indicator for each channel, the channel A and channel B. Now, as you will see in the data, those do come on before we hit 1% THD. Actually, probably half a percent, I think they were coming on, and that's putting out close to 250 watts per channel when they start coming on. So to me, they are give you a little bit of headroom once you start seeing them. Doesn't mean that your sound is going to be really distorted. Also, you have the two uh, gain potentiometers for each channel, and they do have detents. Let's see if you can hear them. So hopefully you heard that. You also have a protect LED that comes on. It monitors, I believe, four different things, temperature, current, voltage, and some other thing, I believe. And I never have had that come on. Sound craftsmen often test their amplifiers by hooking them up to direct shorts, and they have to survive like eight to 10 times. So I was unable to find an owner's manual where they actually showed that test being done, but it wouldn't surprise me if this did have that test as part of its owner's manual. You can also see the specs on it out here that it could do 750 watts into 8 ohms as a bridged amplifier. And you will see in a little bit with the data how well it did on that claim. This obviously is the rear of the RA7501. And starting off over here at the right, we do have a 10 amp user replaceable fuse. We also have massive heat sinks here for our output devices to cool better. Now here are our inputs and they are a quarter inch phono jack inputs, I call them, and they are for balanced operation. For all of my use and testing, I use a quarter inch to RCA adapter right here, so it means I'm testing unbalanced. These two guys here are our three-way binding posts for each channel. They are banana jack friendly. And if you want to use this into the mono bridge mode, what you do is you pull this guy out. You can just see this little um, white line and he lines up here. So you pull this out and you flip it 180 degrees and then the white line would line up here. And then you would connect your speaker terminals between those two red three-way binding posts for mono operation. 
Here is what the RA7501 looks like with the top cover removed. And it's connected with a lot of nice connectors, which makes it easy to service, should that be required. You can kind of see there's a row of output transistors here and here. That would be for one channel. And then on the other side, you have them. You have output transistors here and here for the other channel. Uh, also, you can see a pretty good size transformer here. There's another transformer here. Hopefully that shows up. That would be for some of the low voltage stuff. And here are our input pots. There's one here and one here, as well as where the LEDs connect to the front panel. I don't know how well this will show up, but there's four capacitors here. And these guys right here are larger. They would be the 22,000 microfarad caps. And I believe these guys right here are either 16 or 11,000 microfarads. So there are for the two different power supplies that the class H circuitry uses. So that's kind of just an inside tour of what the RA7501 looks like. Right now we have the THD SNR plot at 1 kilohertz with the RA7501 putting out about 5 watts into 8 ohms. And I'm also showing the THD plus noise as a percent since that is how the original specification was listed. There was not a spec at 5 watts. It's at a max power rating, but we'll get into that later on. I do have the gain set for 29 dB, which is typically where I'll set an amplifier. But I'm kind of curious what happens if I max this out. And so I will do that now. So I've maxed the input level controls such that they're fully clockwise, I guess. These are detented, by the way, so it makes it kind of easy to set them up. And we went from 5 watts to about 7.5 watts. You can see that the gain went from 29 dB or so to 31 dB. So I don't know that it really made a lot of difference in the response here. So just to remain more consistent with how I do my measurements, I'm going to go ahead and move it down to around uh, 28 to 29 dB. So back down to 29 dB, which is probably where I will keep it for most of the measurements. Here we have the frequency response from 20 hertz to 20 kilohertz of the RA7501, putting out about 5 watts into 8 ohms, and the gain controls are set for about 29 dB. The frequency response specification was plus or minus 0.25 dB over that frequency range. And you can see at worst case, right over this part of the band, we are down maybe, I don't know, 0.45 dB worst case. And the channels are balanced to within oh, 0.05 dB. So it's looking pretty good. It's not quite at the 0.25 dB, but, but I'll take 0.45 dB any day of the week. Here's our standard THD SNR plot at one kilohertz with the RA7501 putting out 5 watts into 4 ohms this time. And you can see we're still set for about 29 dB of gain. THDs are looking pretty good at 0.04%. And the THD plus noise also is around 0.04%. And the SNRs are about 82 dB, we'll call it. Here is the frequency response of the RA7501 from 20 hertz to 20 kilohertz, with it putting out about 5 watts into 4 ohms, and it looks almost identical to how it looked when it was putting out 5 watts into 8 ohm loads. We're down maybe 5 to 6 tenths of a dB at 20 kilohertz. The channels are balanced to within about 0.05 dB, and just like with the 8 ohm case, the frequency response was plus or minus 0.25 dB over that frequency range. So it's doing really pretty good. This plot shows the output impedance of the RA7501, and that translates to a damping factor of about 145. Now, the specification for this was that the damping factor when in stereo mode should be greater than 250. And in bridge mono mode, it should be 
greater than 125, and that was at 50 hertz. So this did not achieve that, but I have rarely seen any amplifier achieve the damping factor other than the Macintosh MC352. But still, 145 is pretty darn good. So right now I'm going to turn on the RA7501 and hopefully you will hear this little thump sound that it makes when it comes on. So it makes a little pop. I actually think it is the transformer for the power supply in this that is making that little pop because I don't see anything weird on the display going on at all when it's doing that. You kind of see it slowly warming up and then um, and then boom it's there. But that little pop I believe is the transformer. Here we have the multi-tone response of the RA7501. It's putting out about 5 watts into 8 ohms. It is giving a distortion free range of between 10 to maybe 11 this plot shows the crosstalk between the channels. In this case, the blue line, which looks like it has the better crosstalk for most of the band, is the crosstalk between the left to the right channel. And then this line right here is the crosstalk from the right channel to the left channel. The worst case crosstalk would be around 50 dB, let's call it. And it looks like it's above 60 dB for quite a bit of the band and then it tapers off to the 50 dB or so for the right channel and the left channel is as high as 90 dB. So the two channels are different and there is no specification for the crosstalk on this unit. Here is the system noise of the RA7501. In this case both gain controls are set for 29 dB of gain. The outputs are looking into 8 ohm loads, and what you're seeing is just the noise level of the system. You know, it's better than 100 dB V down, and here, this guy right here would be a power supply humbar at 180 hertz. Here's another one at 120 hertz, and then you have another, uh, probably the biggest one here at 60 hertz, and that's down about 70 dB. Here we have the THD SNR plot at 1 kilohertz with the RA7501 putting out between 250 and 255 watts into 8 ohms at 1 kilohertz. And we do have a specification for a 0.02% THD plus noise, which would be this one right here, these two guys right here. And we are at about 0.03%. So we're basically meeting that requirement. Also, there was another requirement for SNR with A weighting of 105 dB. So we're at about 100 dB, so a bit off on that. But overall, for an amplifier from 1981, this thing is really doing well. Here we have the THD SNR plot at 1 kilohertz with the RA7501 putting out 374 to 377 watts into 4 ohms. The maximum amount of power into 4 ohms was 375 watts per channel, and the THD plus noise would be less than 0.02%. Well, we are there in the 4 ohm load. Our SNRs are 95 to 97 dB with A weighting. The specification was uh, 105 dB SNR, so we're not quite there yet, but we're still doing pretty good. And we're still set for 29 dB of gain for the amplifier. So it is meeting most of its requirements at 4 ohms. I am now going to see how much power I can get before our clipping gets really bad, our distortion. And right now we're at about 375, so we'll go up a little bit. The clipping lights are not on yet. They're still not on, and we're looking really good as far as distortion, and we don't see any products. So we're at over 400 watts, and we still don't have any clipping indicators on, on the front, and we're still looking really good. 420 watts. The clipping LEDs just came on, at least for channel A, which would be the right channel, and we are going to increase that a little bit more. So now I have both clipping indicators on. However, the THD 
plus noise is still less than 0.03 percent it's still really good so this thing can easily do 450 watts and in case you're wondering the amplifier is drawing about 12 and a half amps ac at this point this plot shows the effect of varying the analyzer's output signal level which is the scale right here so uh, minus 13 would be about a 5 watt into 8 ohm output for the RA7501 and the plus 4 would be about 250 watts into 8 ohms and this is all done at 1 kilohertz with the RA7501 looking into 8 ohm loads and basically it shows that the distortion doesn't really get that bad it's really worse at the lower power levels over here and as you start um, increasing the power level the worse it ever gets is maybe this would be 0.3 and point or point oh three and point oh two so somewhere about 0.025 percent thd plus noise is the worst that the thd gets for this particular ra7501 this plot shows the thd versus frequency for a couple different output power levels and that's into eight ohms the 4 would be an equivalent to about 250 watts and minus 14 would be about 4.5 watts and that's into 8 ohms and so basically across the entire range of frequencies from 20 hertz to 20 kilohertz we are better than this would be 0.03 percent so we're better than 0.03 percent THD plus noise which would be about the requirement or a little bit above the requirement, which was 0.02%. It's looking pretty good for an amplifier that's this age. This is a plot that is used to calculate the IM distortion, which is a maximum of 0.05%. And the way it's done is that you put in a 19 kilohertz tone and a 20 kilohertz tone, they're equal level, and then you start looking at certain products, and there is this real interesting... Uh, spreadsheet calculation see if I can bring it up here there's this formula over here and basically the IM distortion that I calculate is less than 0 0.000 we'll call it 5% so it is way below the specification here we have the RA7501 putting out 5 watts into 8 ohms and it is in the bridged mono mode now there really is not any specification that I could find other than the max power into 8 ohms when it's bridged mono however for reference purposes we're looking at about 0.07% THD plus noise and about 84 dB SNR and you can see the gain is 33 dB so it's a bit higher when it's in bridged mono mode here is the frequency response from 20 Hz to 20 kHz of the RA7501 in bridged mono mode. This is for an 8 ohm load and you can see it's down a tenth of a dB or at 20 Hz and at 20 kHz it's maybe 0.45 dB. So it's maybe a little worse here at 20 Hz but other than that it looks pretty good. Here is the multi-tone response of the RA7501 with it acting as a monoblock amp into 18 ohms and it's showing a distortion free range of between about 12 to 14 bits. Here we have the Sound Craftsman RA7501 putting out 752 watts into 8 ohms at we'll call it 0.05% THD plus noise um, the THD is a little bit better than that, 0.04%, and we have an SNR of 73 dB. So this is really outstanding for this amplifier working as a monoblock, and the gain um, is at 32 dB. Basically, when you put it in mono, it goes from 29 dB of gain to 32 dB of gain. As I mentioned earlier, this is my own amplifier and I've been using it for several years in my main system which has the Carver CT7 preamp as well as either the KEF 107 reference speakers or the Wilson Watt 3 Puppy 2 loudspeakers. And this amplifier works just fine. It has plenty of power and the only reason that I'm replacing it is that I had an 
opportunity to purchase a Macintosh amplifier, which I've always wanted something with those big blue meters and I'm not sure whether you've already seen the review on that Macintosh or you will be seeing it before you see this one because I haven't done the video on the Macintosh which is a Macintosh MC352 so it's rated at 350 watts per channel into 8 ohms and it was just a deal that I couldn't pass up so this was replaced by the Macintosh 352 and it caused me to rearrange my system to get it the Macintosh to fit, but I'm hoping that the Macintosh power guard lights don't come on. The clipping lights on this would come on when I would be playing very loud into the KEF 107 loudspeakers. And the distortion was never really heard, but it bothered me that the clipping lights came on. So when the opportunity to buy the Macintosh with those lovely big blue meters came up, I just had to do it. So anyway, that's kind of why this got replaced. I'm going to hold on to this amp. Uh, I believe power amps are like hard drives. You can never have enough spares. So anyway, as far as anything wrong with this amp, no, there's nothing wrong. It sounds great. It does have that little quirk when you press the power on button. In a few seconds, you hear a little pop. Now, you heard that little pop sound in the data. Now that little pop was made going into a dummy load and I thought it was just a transformer but when I hooked this back up to the Wilsons and terminated the inputs and did my normal uh, hum test with just this in the system and when I press it on you hear the pop coming out of that speaker so it's more than just a little transformer there's a small little pop it's been doing that for a couple years you know it's just one of those little quirks with it when you power this off there's just a small little turn off sound it's not really much of a pop it's very min minuscule now as far as hum you do hear a little bit of a hum and hiss when you're right next to the wilson watt three puppies you move back about two feet and you don't really hear anything at that point and that's pretty much normal for the amplifiers that i've tested or receivers there's almost always some kind of a hum so that would be the only little quirk if you play this really loud, it gets a little warm, never really hot to where you can't touch the heat sinks. But if you're driving it very loud, it will get a little warm. So you would want to make sure that it has some ventilation in the back. But I would say for the most part, just normal listening levels, you know, 5, 10, 15, 20 watts, it, it doesn't get more than just a little warm. So other than that, I think, you know, it doesn't lack anything with the highs or the lows or mid range or the imaging. It's just a good power amp. I think that Sound Craftsman does a good job with their uh, amplifiers, at least all the ones that I've heard so far. So if you happen to see one of these things and can pick it up and, and make sure that you test it, listen for hum, anything weird, they are a really um, nice amplifier in my opinion. And I think you can get a very nice buy on them. So that being said, I would definitely recommend the Sound Craftsman amplifiers. I guess I'm a little biased. As you've seen in some of my earlier videos, the very first real power amp I bought was the Sound Craftsman MA5002, which was pretty much like this, other than it had some VU power meters in the front. And it was basically the same power ratings and everything else. I think they improved the circuitry a little bit, but uh, it's basically the same amplifier. So I was very much already a fan of the Sound Craftsman amplifier gear. And when this came up at the price I got it for, I thought it was a good deal. So once again, I thank you for taking time out of your day or night to watch the video. And if you like the video, of course, hit the thumbs up. If you haven't subscribed to the channel, please do so. It helps the channel grow. And of course, I like to hear your comments or anecdotes that you have had relating to this or anything else. Sorry, my voice is a little scraggly for whatever reason. And once again, I thank you for watching. And until next time, have a great day or night.